response. If you have an issue, you can uh, put it on the chat section and we will be able to respond to it kindly. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, Irene. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is John Caregua. I'm the attorney director at Strategia Netherlands uh, based in uh, Rotterdam in the Netherlands. Uh, we want to welcome you to this webinar. I can see we have uh, logins from uh, Durban, Uganda, Nigeria, uh, Tunisia, Tanzania, Somaliland. Thank you very much. Um, today we've partnered with uh, Capacity Africa based in Nairobi, Kenya to bring you this free webinar on the introduction of water and sanitation costs among other webinars planned uh, this year. Our two organizations have over 10 years experience training national and international NGOs, governments and uh, United Nations bodies. We have together trained over 10,000 professionals in total. This is our second webinar targeting development organizations. On Tuesday, we had a very successful webinar on monitoring and evaluation, which will run again after two weeks. Uh, next week, we have two webinars on grants management and uh, project management which are key courses in uh, development uh, sector. We offer certificates, uh, diploma and postgraduate uh, diploma courses in over 200 humanitarian and development courses. We also offer uh, in-house training and consultancies in development programs such as uh, evaluation, project design, fundraising. Uh, most of our tra trainers have previously worked in development and humanitarian organizations. We collaborate with international organizations and other institutes of higher learning in the delivery of our capacity building services. Um, why do we focus on water hygiene and sanitation interventions? This sector is important in development work. Well, depending on your interest and experience in WASH, there are numerous reasons why WASH programs are important. First, water, health, and sanitation management have become critical element in development sector, especially in both developed and developing uh, nations. More than half the world population cannot access a toilet or running water, uh, safe water, making the issue a global priority. Provision of water, hygiene and sanitation services is a concern of every government uh, all over the world. Waterborne diseases such as diarrhea are a major contributor to mortality uh, in developing countries where the provision of relief and humanitarian emergency services always have wash component to prevent and control the spread of communicable diseases. Water and sanitation stakeholders are daily tasked with creating innovative interventions to increase access to water to wash uh, services to communities. In addition, investments uh, in the sector requires that communities adopt behavior change through knowledge, attitude changes, and practice, what we call CAP. And of course, the outcome of all those efforts is reduction in communicable diseases. Demand for water services, uh, wash uh, services is highest in humanitarian situations in rural areas and including um, the urban areas and also such as the slums. What the main benefits of uh, taking water and sanitation costs, wash is one of the most marketable professions in development work. Uh, if you have arm yourself with uh, water, and sanita water and sanitation skills, um, you have higher chances of getting a job in an NGO or in other development or government organizations. You have higher chances for job promotion in an NGO if you specialize in a wash sector. A water and sanitation officer or manager has skills to make a difference in a community as well as uh, in the organization. Uh, those who uh, execute wash consultancies know how uh, the consultancies are well paying. Um, I would now like to invite uh, Stephen Moshami to take us through the introduction to water hygiene and sanitation costs. And thereafter, uh, we will have questions and answers. Uh, and uh, Ms. Irene Ocheno from Capacity Africa will then take you through the processes of how our courses are delivered after the graduation. Thank you very much and uh, welcome. Hello. Okay, let us be a little patient as uh, Stephen is connecting. 
he's having a bit of challenges, but uh, give us a minute and then he'll be able to connect. If you have uh, any questions, uh, you can type them on the, uh, the chat side um, and we'll get our, our moderator to uh, answer them at the, as we close the uh, session. And thank you very much for joining in uh, in this um, webinar. A number of uh, things that we need to be able to understand uh, so that we can be able to uh, see how to be able to uh, navigate through these uh, uh, sessions that give you uh, a, a, a very foundational platform uh, into uh, water sanitation and hygiene, and that's what we basically want to be able to tie ourselves to. Uh, this discussion uh, will just revolve around uh, uh, water sanitation and hygiene. And so I uh, just want to welcome you all and um, uh, make sure that um, uh, as we go through the session, uh, you can pick some of the questions that you may have, some of the comments that you may have uh, as I run through this and uh, probably uh, just see uh, if I can be able to uh, handle this uh, in uh, uh, in about uh, uh, 70 minutes or so, uh, so that um, we can have some enough time for uh, feedback, uh, questions and answer. And uh, that's what we, uh, we are going to be able to uh, have the structure for today. So, uh, so follow with me as I look through uh, some of these uh, foundational concepts that give you um, a good introduction into water and sanitation and hygiene, uh, particularly for some of us who are relatively new in this particular area, uh, you might just want to be able to get familiar uh, with some of the foundational concepts around uh, uh, this particular uh, area. So, uh, so it's good to be able to uh, uh, follow with us and um, and um, be able to um, uh, be able to look at how to uh, actually be able to uh, understand how some of these concepts become very very critical. So what we are looking at here uh, is very very foundational. And um, uh, if you want to be able to um, have a deep in-depth study uh, into this particular course, uh, then that's why we are reminding you that you can register into our courses, and Irene will be giving 
uh, some further details on that um, at the end of this session. So, uh, so looking forward uh, to be able to uh, have you participate in this particular discussion uh, as much as possible. Uh, so uh, let's be able to begin uh, this discussion today as we look at um, uh, this agenda that we dis definitely have for today. So what are our session objectives for today? So one, we want to make sure that we have an introduction uh, into uh, water, sanitation and hygiene. Uh, then secondly, uh, the other thing that we are going to do uh, is to be able to highlight uh, the issue of the global distribution of fresh water. So uh, looking at um, uh, the global distribution of fresh water uh, is something that um, also we ought to be concerned about. And then again also, uh, the other thing is to make sure that we are able to have an overview uh, of the sphere standards. Uh, so ensuring that um, uh, we can actually uh, be able to go through the overview of sphere standards. And um, the other thing is also to discuss the significance uh, of the F diagram uh, in WASH interventions as expected. So, uh, so we'll also be able to uh, look at the significance of the F diagram in WASH interventions as expected. Then again also, uh, the other thing is to be able to provide uh, an overview of community-led total sanitation. Uh, so uh, it is important uh, to make sure uh, that we are able to have that. So, uh, so it is important uh, to ensure that um, uh, we can be able to have um, a good overview of what community-led total sanitation uh, is all about. And then lastly, we will also be able to have uh, a participant's feedback session uh, at the end of the session, uh, just to be able to hear what are some of the questions and what are some of the comments uh, that most of you will have uh, regarding uh, most of these areas as much as possible. So, uh, so we'll be looking at that and uh, ensuring that uh, we are able to uh, handle that uh, uh, in, in, in such a, an, an easy way as, as possible. Uh, so let's just uh, be able to uh, navigate through uh, the topics that we have for today. And, um, and then uh, we will be able to hear your feedback. So let's just start with the first area uh, that we need to look at. And this is the issue of um, uh, introduction to water and sanitation, uh, just to be able to uh, maybe just look also at the nature of the problem uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, inadequate um, water supply, uh, inadequate sanitation, and uh, poor hygiene practices, and what are some of the impacts that that has as we try to introduce uh, why water sanitation and hygiene um, interventions are therefore critical uh, because of some of those uh, aspects as much as possible. So, uh, so we'll be emphasizing that uh, just to be able to give uh, a foundational uh, access. So, uh, so, so it's good to be able to uh, uh, follow with us and, uh, and uh, uh, it's good uh, that you will actually be able to walk with me through this particular uh, session. So let me say one, uh, the first thing that we want just to uh, firmly uh, establish uh, is the fact that um, uh, we want to be able to emphasize uh, this whole issue. Uh, we want to make sure we can emphasize uh, this whole aspect uh, of uh, uh, community, uh, 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 the whole issue of um, uh, water and sanitation uh, in, in communities. And um, uh, it is important for us to be able to, uh, to understand that uh, as much as possible and ensure that um, uh, we are able to have a very good, uh, we're able to have a very good emphasis uh, about that. And um, uh, it is good to make sure that um, uh, we can actually be able to see uh, what exactly uh, we are talking about. So, uh, so, so safe water, uh, safe drinking water, uh, sanitation and hygiene are very, very fundamental. Uh, in uh, improving standards of living uh, for people. And uh, that is why it is important to be able to pay uh, particular attention uh, to uh, issues to do with uh, water, sanitation, and hygiene, uh, which become very, very important uh, in terms of improving standards uh, uh, of people. And um, this is something that you know has been entrenched in a number of global standards. And um, you also know that uh, most uh, uh, governments around the world are also trying to see how to best tackle the issue of uh, provision of water, uh, sanitation and hygiene. 
as, uh, particularly in the COVID era, uh, where we have seen how um, uh, WASH interventions have really become important, uh, particularly in this uh, post-COVID um, uh, uh, era. So, so it's very, very important uh, to make sure that we can be able to uh, be able to uh, uh, emphasize uh, interventions around um, uh, water supply, sanitation, and hygiene. Now, uh, the improved standards of WASH has a number of benefits, and um, it is important for us to be able to identify some of those benefits. And um, one of the things that um, we need to be able to understand uh, is that um, uh, improved um, uh, standards of WASH will definitely be able to lead to better uh, physical health. And uh, this is something that, uh, of course, right now we can identify with uh, because of the challenge that um, uh, globally uh, uh, we have faced in regards to the COVID crisis. And you know that uh, uh, the issue of water interventions has actually been able to be one of the significant uh, uh, effective fights uh, against the, the, the COVID uh, health crisis. And uh, also the issue of protection of the environment has also been a significant highlight uh, because um, you're not going to destroy the environment and still be able to be assured of uh, um, having access to uh, safe drinking water. And then again, also, uh, it also uh, is able to lead to better educational outcomes. Uh, it is also able to have convenience um, uh, uh, in terms of time savings because uh, you understand in most, uh, especially in developing countries, uh, women particularly spend quite a number of hours uh, looking for hours. And so uh, when we have appropriate wash sanitations, then we would expect that we'll have significant uh, time savings um, uh, in terms of the uh, time that is spent just looking for water. And then again, also, this assures uh, that the lives lived uh, will be with dignity and equal treatment uh, for both uh, men and women as expected. So it's very, very uh, important uh, to make sure that um, uh, we can be able to address uh, some of these um, uh, particular uh, issues. So, uh, so it's very, very important uh, to basically be able to understand uh, why we are emphasizing the whole issue uh, of uh, uh, water sanitation and hygiene. Uh, again, also something else that um, uh, we can mention uh, is the fact that um, uh, whenever you have poor and vulnerable uh, populations uh, having uh, lower access, having lower, uh, excuse me, <coughs> uh, so um, whenever you have poor and vulnerable populations um, that actually have lower access to improved uh, wash services, and have um, uh, they, they definitely be able uh, to be associated with poorer associated behaviors. And so uh, it is important to make sure that um, uh, as much as possible, we can ensure that the access and the availability of wash services is actually guaranteed, especially for poor and vulnerable uh, populations to make sure that we can actually be able to improve uh, some of the hygiene practices that they actually do and some of the sanitation practices that actually happen uh, where uh, poor and vulnerable populations are actually living. So, uh, so it's important to be able to take a uh, particular uh, note on some of those things as, as we are emphasizing. Again, also, uh, uh, another important thing uh, is to ensure that we can be able to have improved wash uh, which is therefore central uh, to ensuring that we can reduce uh, poverty, uh, also that we can ensure that we are able to promote equality and also ensure that we can actually be able some, uh, to support uh, socioeconomic development as much, uh, as much as possible. And somebody will ask, you know, how does improved wash uh, services actually reduce poverty. And um, uh, one of the things that you know is that uh, uh, we normally define people who are uh, below the poverty line as people who uh, earn less than a dollar uh, per day. And um, one of the reasons why we're saying uh, having an improved wash services uh, basically allows people not to fall under uh, uh, they uh, uh, fall under below the poverty line uh, is the sense that uh, we are saying if somebody uh, actually earns let's say a hundred um, uh, uh, let's say one dollar uh, per day and that's basically what they earn or they probably earn two dollars per day but you can imagine um, poor sanitation lack of water access 
and poor hygiene practices will always be able to increase the disease burden uh, for this particular population. And that um, you will find that significant amount of money that they earn actually goes to treating uh, different kind of diseases and uh, also uh, spending that also on trying to buy water or going uh, long distances to be able to look for water or uh, if people, uh, especially uh, the vulnerable that live in cities, maybe uh, going for um, 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 uh, 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 far places to be able to look at a place uh, where they can get a sanitation facility, especially uh, in the informal settlements, in urban centers. And that's why we say uh, improved watch services is actually very essential in terms of reducing uh, poverty, uh, also ensuring that we promote equality because uh, for, for, for one of the things why we we'll say um, uh, watch services will actually be able to promote equality, you know that um, um, uh, it is actually women uh, that actually suffer when there is um, uh, uh, poor water supply because it's women that will actually be the ones who take care of their households and um, uh, in most of the populations you will find uh, that women spend quite a number of hours just trying to look for water. Uh, for for use at the household level and and and, and provision of water just allows women not to uh, just uh, uh, be concerned about um, looking for water but basically get an opportunity also to uh, devote that time uh, to going to school to empowering themselves and ensuring that we can actually be able to achieve what we call uh, gender equality and also as you're saying also supporting the social economic development as expected and so that's why drinking water and sanitation have actually been targets uh, for some of you uh, who have been able to um, uh, familiarize yourself with the Millennium Development Goals um, that uh, uh, were in existence up to the year 2015, uh, where uh, after 2015, that's the post-2015 period, then we were able uh, to transform uh, the Millennium Development Goals into Sustainable Development Goals. And most of you remember that um, uh, in the Sustainable Development Goals, we actually expanded the goals uh, that we were actually supposed to be able to cover uh, to about 17 goals. And um, uh, you know that uh, there's been a lot of, uh, there's been a lot of um, uh, anticipation uh, in regards to uh, how different countries are performing uh, in the uh, strategic development goals because the UN has actually been able to mandate, um, has actually been able to mandate organizations to make sure uh, that they are actually able to uh, provide, uh, um, uh, they're able actually to, uh, to be able to uh, look into ways to ensure uh, that we can, uh, we can actually be able to reach these targets uh, specifically uh, by the year 20, um, uh, by the year 2030. And um, uh, it is important for us to be able to be familiar uh, with these uh, strategic development goals. In fact, I will urge all of us uh, to make sure that um, we are able to review that uh, because we will be working in wash sector and uh, these uh, goals really define a lot of uh, the indicators even that we set for ourselves uh, in the organizations just to make sure that we are part of uh, the uh, the problem uh, to ensuring that these targets uh, we are part of the solution to ensuring that these targets are actually met uh, as much as expected so uh, so it is important uh, for us to be able to have that understanding then again also uh, member states uh, of the United Nations uh, have actually been able to aspire to achieve universal access to WASH uh, by 2030. And so, um, uh, so these member states uh, in the United Nations uh, want to make sure that they can actually be able to achieve universal access of WASH uh, by 2030. And um, that has been very, very uh, important as well. And so uh, one of the things that um, has actually happened is that the human right to safe drinking water and sanitation, that is what we refer to as HRTWS, uh, was actually adapted in 2010 under a UN resolution that was actually calling for safe, affordable, acceptable, uh, available and accessible drinking 
water and sanitation services fall. So those characteristics are very, very critical, even as we, uh, as we are able to look at our different um, wash interventions that we actually do. So it is important for us to ask ourselves, is the water that is being provided safe? Is the water that is being provided and the sanitation that is being provided um, uh, affordable? Uh, um, are wash services acceptable? Are they available? And they, are they accessible? Uh, which was a very uh, critical understanding for us to be able to have uh, so that we can be able to move to the point where we can say that um, it is actually a human right uh, to actually ensure that there is safe access to drinking water and sanitation, uh, which is something that um, uh, uh, most of you know that the, the UN has actually been uh, at the forefront uh, trying to champion that as much as possible. So, uh, so, so it is important uh, to make sure that um, uh, we can actually be able to, uh, we can actually be able to understand uh, some of those uh, uh, important uh, aspects as much as as possible. So, uh, so it is good uh, to be able to have that um, as 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 a critical um, as a critical thing to to be able to understand. Now, the other thing is um, we look at the coverage of water supply, uh, sanitation and hygiene, and um, just be able to look at some, uh, uh, some little statistics uh, that basically try to show us um, how the coverage of uh, uh, water and sanitation has been uh, globally, and uh, just look at some of the challenges that have been there uh, in terms of uh, the provision uh, of water supply, sanitation, and hygiene globally. I think it's good uh, to be able to have that uh, particular understanding uh, in, a very, uh, in a very clear way. So, uh, so it's good uh, to make sure that we can understand that. So let's just uh, look at some statistics uh, for some of us uh, who enjoy uh, looking at some statistics. I think it's good to basically be able to see the nature of the problem uh, so that we see why wash interventions are that critical. Uh, once you look at some of these statistics, then you will understand the nature of the problem and why um, uh, it is uh, clearly important to be able to address this matter as, 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 as soon as possible. So, uh, so it is good uh, to be able to understand that as, as much as possible. Now, um, when you look at water supply, uh, globally, uh, the use of improved drinking water sources uh, has actually been able to increase uh, from 76% uh, uh, in 1990 uh, to 91% in 2015. And um, I'm sure most of you can understand why there has been that remarkable improvement. Um, I'm sure you're able to understand uh, why that um, uh, improvement has actually been able to take place uh, from 76% to 91%. Now we're saying globally that about 91% um, um, of the entire globe is actually able to use improved drinking water sources. And part of this um, uh, success has been brought about by the Millennium Development Goals. Because remember, uh, during this period, uh, from the year 2000 to the year 2015, uh, that's where we had the Millennium Development Goals, where governments were being pushed to ensure that uh, this provision of uh, safe drinking water uh, and also uh, good sanitation and hygiene practices and uh, this was remarkable to be able to bring that. However, uh, from these global estimates, uh, we are able still to mask some regional disparities and also some inequities uh, in access uh, between urban and rural uh, populations. So, so, uh, so the problem is, as much as we can talk about, we have 91% uh, in, um, use of improved drinking water um, uh, access. Uh, one of the things that surely uh, is still a problem is that there are still disparities between urban and rural population. And, and most of you understand that, um, uh, especially one of the things that really uh, compounds uh, the challenges in urban areas is because of the uh, increasing uh, rural to urban migration that we have, um, uh, we, we actually witness, especially in the developing countries and uh, majority of sub-Saharan Africa, uh, where there's uh, a lot of movement into the cities, and also the issue of uh, uh, arid and semi-arid uh, uh, regions uh, uh, in different parts of the world, uh, where it is not actually uh, enough uh, to provision uh, wash infrastructure because of some of the challenges that come 
uh, in between uh, because of uh, some of the low populations in some of these areas. And so uh, you understand when we're able to talk about this kind of disparity, uh, what exactly uh, has actually uh, been able to bring it up. So as of 2015, uh, then six, um, uh, um, uh, 663 million uh, people uh, still were able to use an improved water sources and uh, uh, compared uh, to 1.3 uh, billion uh, in 1990 uh, is what uh, was actually able to happen. And then again, uh, we have 2.6 billion people uh, that have actually been able to gain access to improved water uh, since uh, 1990. So, so you can see uh, the kind of improvement that has actually been able to, uh, been able to happen uh, since 1990 as well. And uh, again, also uh, another uh, interesting perspective, uh, uh, interesting statistics that we see uh, is the fact that uh, uh, the rural dwellers um, remain underserved uh, compared to the urban dwellers. And that's something that um, uh, we, uh, we can be able, uh, we can be able to see. Uh, a lot of rural dwellers uh, have actually remained unserved by wash services uh, compared to the urban dwellers. And uh, this has actually been in the zone of 16% uh, uh, to 4% uh, respectively. So you can see uh, urban dwellers um, have actually uh, been well served at 16%. And then um, um, we are able to see uh, the rural uh, um, uh, dwellers at, um, at, at, at 4%. So, uh, so, so they remain uh, quite, quite uh, underserved. Uh, as much as, as possible. And um, in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, we are able to see that 44% of rural dwellers uh, continue to use an improved water supply. And, and, and you can be able to have a justification of some of uh, uh, why these challenges are, are, you know, they're able to affect the rural uh, dwellers um, more than even the urban dwellers uh, is because you understand um, the kind of um, regions we are talking about, uh, some of these places are arid and semi-arid, so they do not have uh, a significant water supply source. And so you have to either uh, drill boreholes, and um, um, drilling boreholes takes a significant amount of resources. Uh, some of these places are sparsely populated, and so it is actually uh, very, very hard uh, to actually have enough infrastructure for all these sparse populations. Again, also, some of these places are conflict-stricken, uh, particularly when you look at different parts of Africa where we know that um, uh, there's been some active uh, conflict zones and um, it is actually uh, not able to uh, be able to improve the water supply, uh, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa. Now, the other thing is that um, water hauling cost uh, for sub-Saharan Africans, uh, particularly women, uh, we have been able to establish that they actually spent billions of hours each year. This is, um, this is quite uh, shocking because uh, you can imagine uh, if you're able to spend uh, billions of hours looking for water, then what if you are spending those hours actually participating uh, in some economic activity? Uh, you know, uh, there would be much, much better development. But you can imagine all these hours are wasted just looking uh, for, for a jerry can of water. And this is uh, a particularly uh, shocking statistic, uh, just to be able to see the amount of time that is wasted uh, in terms of looking for, for water. Again, also, uh, urban areas are continuing to enjoy a high level of water service, uh, as indicated, uh, using piped water supply, uh, because in 2015, uh, four out of five people that were living in urban areas uh, were able to use piped water uh, compared uh, to two or three uh, in rural areas. Um, and this is another um, uh, interesting perspective to be able to see. So, uh, so four out of five people um, uh, in urban areas uh, were able to use piped water uh, compared to two uh, uh, or three, uh, I mean to two of three uh, in rural areas. And um, this is something that tells you uh, the challenge that we have in terms of meeting water supply demands in rural areas. So, uh, so uh, urban areas are, are a bit better served, uh, but uh, rural areas we still have uh, quite a challenge in terms of uh, provision of 
uh, of water. Then again, also the other thing, uh, water sources um, um, have actually been classified as improved, do not guarantee uh, the safety or continuity uh, of the water supply. And so it is important to actually be able to uh, understand that uh, as much as possible. Now, water quality surveys uh, that have actually been conducted in five countries uh, were able to show uh, that microbiological compliance with WHO guidelines varied between water sources and um, countries. And uh, you know, here we talk about the coliform uh, units. And um, this is, um, uh, in terms of CFU uh, parameters, uh, there was a lot of uh, differences when you look at uh, different countries that were actually uh, part of this uh, survey. And um, uh, you're able to see that uh, uh, a lot of water that is consumed is actually to a very large extent, uh, very, very unsafe. And so on average, uh, compliance was actually close to 90% uh, for piped water sources and uh, from 40 to 70% for other uh, improved sources uh, as expected. So, uh, so on average, uh, we were able to note um, uh, compliance uh, was actually a big challenge, uh, which was basically uh, close to 90% for piped water sources and 40% uh, to 70% for other improved uh, uh, sources as well. And so, and so it is good to be able to understand some of those uh, 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 very uh, worrying statistics uh, in regards to water supply. Let's just cross over and now look at um, sanitation. Let's just uh, be able to review uh, what are some of the uh, statistics that we have uh, in regards to uh, sanitation. So, uh, so those are some of the things that uh, uh, we uh, we can be able to uh, uh, we can be able to uh, see um, uh, how the nature of the problem uh, in sanitation has been uh, over the years. Now, the use of improved sanitation uh, has actually been able to increase uh, from 54% uh, in 1990 uh, to 68% in 2015. Uh, again, also a remarkable uh, improvement uh, because um, 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 uh, at, at 1990, you can imagine, 54% uh, uh, um, uh, of the population uh, did not, uh, uh, was actually uh, in need uh, of uh, improved uh, sanitation around this time. Uh, but now uh, this has been able to increase from 54 uh, to 68 percent in 2015. And uh, it's very, very important to be able to understand that. Then again, also in 2015, um, uh, 2.4 billion people uh, still do not have access uh, to their own improved sanitation facility. And this is something that um, uh, is also worrying uh, because uh, 2.4 people, uh, uh, billion people uh, cannot actually be able to have access uh, to their uh, uh, to an improved sanitation facility. Uh, quite a worrying statistic. And again, also uh, these numbers actually mask the fact that since 1990, uh, over 1.2 uh, uh, sorry, over over 2.1 billion people have actually been able to gain access to improved sanitation. Uh, so, uh, so it is much, much better and, um, uh, uh, than it was in 1990. And so uh, it is important to be able, uh, uh, to, be able to understand that, uh, that there's been some improvement in sanitation uh, uh, to, to those uh, numbers that we are showing there. And again, also globally, uh, the proportion of population still practicing open defecation uh, was able to decline uh, from 24% in 1990 uh, to only 13% uh, in 2015. But you can see we still have some work because still 13% globally uh, is still a big population uh, that actually needs to uh, be, um, uh, 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 be, be emphasized on uh, why uh, the practice of open defecation is not good. And one of the things that I will also be doing uh, through this session is I will be taking you through uh, uh, the, the, um, uh, one of the approaches that we actually be able, uh, we're able to use, uh, which we call community-led uh, total sanitation, uh, which is one of the approaches that actually tries to really, really, really abolish uh, this practice of uh, open defecation. And, uh, <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, so one of the things that um, we will actually be doing uh, is to make sure that we are able to 
uh, we are actually able to uh, show you uh, why that um, uh, uh, CLTS is a very good um, uh, practice to make sure that uh, uh, we can uh, we can ensure that we can deal with uh, practices poor practices uh, like uh, open defecation as much as as possible. Uh, again, now let's also uh, say a few things about hygiene uh, because we've looked at uh, water supply. Uh, we also looked some statistics on um, um, uh, on uh, the issue of sanitation. And again, also, we are also need to look on some few statistics here uh, on the issue of hygiene as well. So, uh, so let's uh, be able to say a few things. Now, um, research studies have been able to suggest that the global uh, prevalence uh, of hand washing with soap uh, after contact with the excreta uh, is 19%. Uh, so, uh, so, so this is something that um, uh, 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 basically, uh, is something that um, uh, we 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 want to minimize as much as possible because you can imagine uh, that um, uh, if we are able to uh, hand, uh, handle handle excreta and you are not able to do hand washing with soap, we know uh, the challenges that uh, that comes with, and so uh, so the prevalence of hand washing with soap after contact with the excreta is at nineteen percent. Uh, globally, and these rates are actually lower in Sub-Saharan Africa, because in Sub-Saharan Africa, you can see this is at 14%, uh, you know, uh, so a lot of work needs to be done there. And um, you understand one of the particular reasons why uh, it is actually lower in Sub-Saharan Africa uh, is the fact that uh, also the challenges of access to water and also provision of soap. So those are some of the things that also compound the, the challenge uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa. And again also, uh, if you look at Southeast Asia at 17%, particularly also suffering from the same uh, challenge also as Sub-Saharan Africa. And that's why the, the levels are, uh, are quite low as we can see uh, where uh, some of these uh, studies have actually been, uh, been conducted. Then uh, the proxy indicators uh, for hand washing practice uh, from national uh, representative surveys um, uh, were not actually uh, very reliable and um, uh, they were actually tending to over report hygiene practices. And so this is uh, a challenge that was actually uh, been able to be noted and uh, necessitated uh, this kind of a survey just to be able to establish uh, the uh, the hygiene practices uh, at a global level. And so uh, it is important to make sure that um, um, uh, we can be able to understand um, uh, some of these uh, challenges as, as much as possible. And um, the other thing is also uh, basically to look at some of the impacts uh, that uh, these particular problems uh, actually comes with. So, uh, so what are some of the uh, impacts of inadequate wash services. Uh, what are some of the challenges of uh, when you don't have, uh, when you have inadequate uh, wash services? What are some of the impacts that uh, uh, come along with that? So, uh, so we want to be able to emphasize that. So one of the things that we will say is that contaminated water and lack of sanitation uh, will always lead to the transmission of pathogens uh, through feces and during and so that's another challenge that we really want to make sure that we can avoid as much as possible again also the diseases that are trans transmitted uh, by the fecal pathway uh, will normally uh, actually be able to include uh, diarrheal disease they will also be able to include a enteric infection um, hepatitis a and hepatitis e uh, poliomyelitis, uh, helminths, trachoma, adenoviruses, uh, particularly one of the most um, um, uh, most severe adenovirus that um, uh, in uh, disease that we normally have is the conjunctivitis, uh, which we know uh, basically uh, affects uh, 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 people and uh, can actually be able to lead to blindness. And it is always important uh, to make sure that uh, there is uh, sufficient water uh, to allow us to be able to deal uh, with that particular uh, uh, disease as much as possible. And most of the diseases also are also transmitted through the fecal oral, oral pathway, uh, but also some uh, will be transmitted through the fecal uh, skin pathway. 
And normally, these transmissions are normally occur between animals and humans. So whenever there is an interaction between animals and humans, uh, this is where we normally get this uh, challenge uh, coming through. And so it is important for us to be able to uh, recognize why the impacts of inadequate wash become um, very uh, important aspects to be able to manage uh, in our wash interventions. And then again also, um, uh, it is also good to say that uh, pathogens carried through urine uh, mainly result in animal uh, to human transmission and uh, that's something that we have been able to see. And then uh, poor personal hygiene uh, normally causes um, uh, fungal skin infections such as ringworm, uh, tinea and um, also scabies as well. And lack of hand washing has actually also been uh, proven to be associated with respiratory infections and uh, uh, that one uh, is well understandable like right now uh, when you're talking about the COVID uh, disease uh, we know that um, uh, we we have uh, whenever hand washing is not uh, well practiced effectively then we will basically be able to have uh, increase in respiratory infections and inadequate hygiene during childbirth uh, is also linked to infection and also to neonatal mortality uh, as expected so uh, so it's good to make sure uh, that some of those uh, things are, are well uh, considered uh, to make sure that uh, uh, we can be able to uh, understand how uh, some of those things uh, need to be uh, need to be improved as as much as possible. So, uh, so it is important uh, for us to be able to understand uh, how to be able to take care uh, of some of those challenges as as, as much as possible. Now let's move further. Uh, let's move further and look at another agenda item uh, that we wanted to look at. Uh, that was just a good brief of taking you through uh, the, uh, uh, the 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 scenario or the situation for water uh, sanitation and hygiene. Uh, now let's just be able to move and look at uh, this issue that we are mentioning about um, uh, access to water supply. Let's just first of all go back and look at um, the global distribution of fresh water because that's where the problem emanates. Sanitation issues will always emanate from we have not been distributed with water. Uh, issues to do with hygiene also go back to the issue of distribution of fresh water. So what is this global distribution of fresh water? Uh, I think it's always good to uh, be able to go back to these basics. And uh, one of the things that we will see uh, is that human beings uh, normally depend on access uh, to enough fresh water for survival. And that's very, very true. Uh, even as know that um, uh, if you miss your glass of water, uh, I don't think you can go beyond a week. <laughs> you know, uh, you can't survive beyond a week without your uh, glass of water. And so uh, it is important that uh, human beings are able to access uh, water for their survival. And that's why uh, globally we have all these uh, water sources um, um, that um, are surrounding us uh, where we live uh, just to make sure that we have enough uh, uh, we have enough access to uh, fresh water however as the figure shows um, on the on the right uh, of my screen uh, is that you will be able to note that about 97 percent of the water globally uh, is actually salty and, and this now complicates the issue of um, uh, availability of water, or rather the uh, global distribution of fresh water, because uh, a lot of what, total water that we have in the world, 97% of it is unconsumable. Now, it is actually salt water that cannot be consumed as it is, you know? And uh, this is basically a big, 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 big um, uh, challenge. And, um, and uh, therefore, uh, we have to be able to look at um, how do we avail uh, suitable uh, water uh, to be consumed by humans. And um, that's now why we have to focus our attention on the 3%, um, uh, uh, the 3%, uh, uh, the rest that is uh, fresh water supply. Now, this figure also illustrates that about uh, roughly 2.5% uh, of fresh water uh, is actually captured in permanent ice uh, or snow, or actually is captured in deep ground water uh, aquifers. And so uh, it is important to actually be able to look at that uh, because 
um, now it can it 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 actually tells you that uh, you know uh, about uh, of 2.5 percent of that water again it's still inaccessible because it's it's actually uh, captured in permanent ice or snow and so it still can't be able to be accessed or that water is sitting down in aquifers uh, 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 in the ground level and so uh, that also uh, brings in that uh, uh, that particular challenge as well so uh, so it is important to see how to be able to navigate that uh, therefore the only remaining 0.5 percent that is available water uh, available fresh water uh, is therefore available uh, in the form of lakes in the form of rivers and also in the form of shallow ground water basins and um, this is the water that is uh, easily accessible uh, to the population and um, this one can actually be accessed uh, by the communities and so it is important to make sure that uh, uh, we can actually be able to see how to uh, the, the kind of challenge that we actually have because 0.5% uh, of the water uh, is what we can find uh, through the natural lakes, through our uh, river uh, reservoirs you know, and um, it is something that um, we, we actually uh, need to be able to uh, see uh, the challenge that is there uh, also for uh, the global distribution of, of water. Now, the other thing that um, is important also to be able to note uh, is that um, fresh water uh, is normally distributed very unevenly uh, over the world. And um, it is important to note a few things because uh, fewer than 10 countries actually possess 60% of the world's available fresh water supply. And, and I mean, this is something that um, uh, is, is, very, uh, is very shocking as well because can you imagine that um, out of that water that we have said is fresh water supply, only 10 countries in the entire world uh, actually possess 60% of that water. So it means the rest of the countries have to share the 40% uh, that is remaining. And um, you can understand this because you understand that um, uh, some of these natural resources are abundant in particular countries and they are actually not available in other countries. And so you understand when we say this, uh, that some of these uh, water resources are not available uh, uh, in, in, in some of the countries um, and so 10 countries actually possess uh, about 60% of this uh, world's uh, fresh water supply. Then again also, uh, only 80% of the world's population is actually served by renewable and accessible water. So it means the rest of the population, that's the 20%, is actually served by non-renewable and non-accessible water. So uh, that's something that uh, uh, is shocking to be able to understand. Uh, moreover, a, a fifth of the world population actually relies on ancient aquifers, uh, that is groundwater sources, uh, that are not renewed anymore presently. And so, uh, so it means uh, when you're able to exhaust uh, an aquifer, uh, then, then, then that's it, um, uh, you know. And um, uh, a fifth of the world population actually relies on ground water uh, from these aquifers, and that's also shocking. This is about uh, about 20% of the entire world uh, basically relying on aquifers. And um, the other thing is that interbasin transfers, uh, that is um, uh, complex and environmental damaging systems of canals, pipes, um, uh, 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 lead water uh, from one basin to the other uh, or uh, on expensively uh, desalinated uh, seawater. So, uh, so some of these uh, interbasin uh, transfers um, uh, um, are able to uh, ensure that um, they're able to uh, uh, transfer water from one basin to the other uh, or basically being able to use the expensive desalinated uh, seawater and um, uh, that is another challenge. Uh, that is uh, important to be able to uh, recognize as well. Now, having looked at the global distribution of, um, of water, let us now narrow down to the global scarcity of water because what that paints you, uh, what, what that uh, is able to paint to you is you can actually be able to see 
that as if the water distribution is like this, if only 10, less than 10 per, uh, countries are able to have access uh, to 60% of the entire fresh water uh, reserves, uh, then, 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 then that brings an issue that you know that most of the countries in the world uh, will actually be able to face what we call water scarcity. Uh, so, uh, so it is important uh, to make sure uh, that you are able to see uh, this particular uh, challenge as as much as uh, as much as possible. So, the issue of global scarcity of water uh, is a significant thing uh, to be able to. Uh, narrow down uh, into as well. Now, water resources are basically under increasing pressure. And so that's something to be able to note because the other thing that we have seen is that the, uh, the availability of fresh water uh, is not that so much available. And so we can actually be able to agree that uh, definitely the water resources are under increasingly um, uh, uh, increasing pressure. And so that's good to be able to note. And this is because population growth, urbanization, and a steep increase in water consumption uh, for domestic uses, for agriculture, for livestock, and for industry have significantly been able to heighten water consumption. And so uh, these are some of the things that are actually leading uh, to ensuring that we do not have enough water as expected. Again, also, uh, climate change uh, has been able to further exacerbate uh, the problem, and so uh, so we have been able to uh, exacerbate um, uh, the the uh, the problem uh, based on that. And uh, this development has actually been able to lead to water scarcity, and possibly uh, even future uh, conflicts, as water sources are widely shared among different nations, regions, and ethnic groups. And you know. Quite a number of countries are actually at that stage uh, right now. Uh, you know, there's uh, 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 there's some uh, potential uh, sources of conflict uh, between uh, Ethiopia and Egypt because of the construction of the Grand Renaissance Dam uh, in Ethiopia, and um, uh, Egypt is not taking that very well, uh, very lightly, because uh, Egypt is actually uh, a country that is largely an arid. Uh, area and um, and uh, it is important that they are able to get uh, water from the river Nile and so uh, uh, Ethiopia uh, in the upper region claiming that they will actually be able to construct um, um, a dam and a massive dam for that matter uh, really diminishes hope uh, for water that is flowing in Egypt and that's a potential uh, source of conflict and that's why we are saying you know uh, future conflicts will be on water scarcity uh, you know and um, that's something that um, uh, is, is something that we have noted uh, in the recent day. Uh, but um, at the occasion of the World Water Day uh, in 2013, uh, the UN was able actually to come up with a fact sheet, uh, which was able to highlight uh, water scarcity as one of the main problems faced by many societies in the 21st century. And it was able to highlight it in the following map, as you can see. So this is um, a map just to show you uh, the extent of water scarcity. So, uh, so you can see where there is deep brown, then you can tell that there's extremely high water scarcity in some of those countries. Uh, so most of you know where you come from, uh, you know which country you come from, uh, or some of you know where you are uh, uh, working uh, in some of your wash interventions. And so you can particularly be able to see the country of interest to you, and you can actually be able to interpret uh, whether that region has water uh, scarcity uh, as expected. And so uh, it is important for you to uh, actually be able to uh, to be able to see that uh, as much as possible. Uh, so uh, uh, so uh, the issue of water scarcity uh, from low uh, to extremely high and the color code uh, will be able to represent um, uh, uh, as the color becomes darker, uh, it actually presents the extremely high water scarcity uh, countries. Uh, that are there. And so uh, it is important for you uh, to make sure that um, you are able to uh, you're able to understand that as much as, as, as possible. Now, the other thing that um, uh, we would want to be able to look at uh, is the issue of the fact that water use has been growing uh, at more than twice the rate uh, of the population uh, uh, 
um, uh, increase in the last century. And so water use has actually been increasing. And, and most of you can understand that um, this is because of population increase as well. The population has been growing over time. So the water use uh, requirements are actually also uh, uh, twice as the population is actually uh, doubling as well, uh, the population growth rate. And uh, by 2025, about um, uh, uh, about um, uh, yeah, you know uh, uh, 800 million people uh, will be living in countries or in regions with absolute uh, water scarcity, and um, about um, uh, two thirds uh, of the world population uh, could actually uh, be under stress conditions as much as as possible. So, uh, so it is important for us to be able to recognize that um, uh, you know we could be able to ensure that this. Uh, is something that is is checked um, as much as possible. The increase in water withdrawals uh, by 2025 uh, is actually expected to be 50% uh, in developing countries and 18% in developed countries. So you can see that whole variation between the developed countries and the developing uh, countries. So uh, so and and this is basically also driven by the fact that um, uh, population growth is higher in developing countries than actually in the developed countries. And this is what compounds the increase in water withdrawals. Although there is no global water scarcity as such, an increasing number of regions are chronically short of water as the map actually illustrates. So, uh, so you can see these countries that are actually in the brown areas uh, uh, tells you uh, the kind of water scarcity uh, that we are able to have. And, and one, of the, one of the most shocking things uh, is the fact that um, uh, right now we are uh, talking about um, uh, the, uh, the, global, uh, the global climate change. And uh, most of you are aware uh, that um, uh, this is going to cause a lot of uh, uh, changes uh, in the water scarcity levels. And so uh, if we do this map again uh, in about 20 years from now, then you would expect to be able to see uh, there are more areas that have green uh, than, some, uh, than, some, uh, than, than, than they were before because uh, right now the environmental degradation is even taking, um, is, is, is going much faster uh, than what it was before because of course of mounting population growth and um, uh, you know all uh, the growth of industrialization uh, in different countries, and um, these are some of the things that we expect uh, will actually be able to compound this problem much much higher. Again, also the map is also able to show uh, that all continents uh, in the world, as well as uh, both developed and developing countries, uh, are actually affected by water scarcity, and also. Uh, have actually been able to already exploit water sources. So in some areas, actually, uh, the water sources that were there have actually been fully exploited and they have dried up. And uh, this is something that we know uh, in most countries, uh, they will actually be at that particular level. And so coping mechanism, um, um, however, are very, and uh, the developing countries are more vulnerable and especially towards the consequences uh, of water scarcity, uh, such as the spread of water-related diseases, uh, food crisis, and natural hazards as, as much as possible. So, uh, so there, are, there are some coping mechanisms. Um, uh, however, uh, these ones will actually be able to vary uh, in developing countries and are more vulnerable, uh, especially towards the consequences of water scarcity. And um, it is something that um, uh, is also a bit worrying. And then again also, this raises attention to access to water uh, for the most marginalized and the need for a legal framework to assure us about the right to water as the most critical factor uh, for, future, uh, for future development. So, uh, so this is something that we actually need to be able to do. And so therefore, water has actually been a precious commodity uh, in drought-prone uh, Illerate, uh, Northern Kenya as shown in this particular photo. Uh, so I uh, just want to show you a photo that just basically uh, um, uh, summarizes that whole issue of water scarcity. So you can imagine that um, uh, this is where, uh, this is what water scarcity has actually been able to lead human beings to be able to come to that particular level. So uh, let me show you some photo and that will be able to help you imagine 
uh, the extent of water uh, scarcity. So, uh, so there you can see uh, there's just uh, uh, a pastoralist in one of the areas, uh, one of the arid areas, and you can see that basically uh, what happens in this area is shallow dug wells and uh, communities uh, basically expect they can be able to draw some water uh, from some of those um, uh, shallow dug wells. Now, the challenge with this is, um, you know, you might um, be very sure that this is not uh, uh, an improved water source. And so uh, it might be able to lead to the impacts that we were able to talk about earlier on about um, uh, the disease um, uh, the disease um, uh, uh, morbidity rates uh, will be able to increase because of uh, some of these uh, issues that we actually are able to see here. So, uh, so this basically paints to you a picture about um, the extent of water scarcity uh, in most uh, in most areas. And so, uh, so with that, let's just now move why it is important to put standards. Uh, for wash interventions. And now I want to be able to take you through to an overview of sphere standards. And um, I want you to make sure that um, uh, you are equally uh, well informed about uh, uh, the standards for sphere, uh, because um, what sphere has done has basically been able to uh, develop some standards um, uh, based on a number of experts that have been, been able to volunteer from across the globe and talk about what specific targets should we actually be able to give uh, in terms of um, water supply, in terms of sanitation, in terms of hygiene, and also in terms of other components as well that they actually include under the sphere uh, guidelines as much as possible. So make sure you're familiar uh, with the sphere guidelines, uh, but this is part of what we take you through the course if you uh, be able to sign up for uh, some of the courses that we are able to offer, we will be able to take you uh, into deeper details uh, uh, into uh, the sphere, uh, uh, into the sphere uh, guidelines. Uh, it is also good to note that I'm also uh, part of uh, uh, one of the certified trainers uh, in uh, uh, certified by Sphere uh, to be able to conduct uh, training on the Sphere standards as well. So, uh, so I think it's good to. Uh, ensure that I, I also mention that as well. Uh, so let's just look at um, uh, some of the uh, some of the uh, standards that we actually are able to have uh, when it comes to uh, the sphere uh, standards. And um, uh, for each of the category that we have here, it will always have some standards. And so uh, basically, we have six components. Uh, we basically used to have just um, uh, 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 some few components, uh, sometimes uh, back uh, about four, uh, but um, Sphere was able to expand the components uh, for, for Sphere standards uh, into six now. And uh, now we are uh, laying attention into these six areas. And of course, uh, the first, uh, uh, the first uh, three uh, really become very, very important. You know, we uh, in WASH, we emphasize about the issue of uh, 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 water supply. We also emphasize the whole issue of sanitation, uh, which uh, is what you're calling excreta management here. And again, also we are also able to emphasize uh, the issue of hygiene. And um, additionally, we are also able to look at the issue of solid waste management, uh, vector control, and wash in disease outbreaks and healthcare settings. And this last component has actually become very, very significant, especially uh, in this COVID um, uh, situation that we have actually been able to have. So uh, this time round, uh, this is something that has actually been able to um, uh, draw a lot of attention. And so I just want to be able to, uh, I'll just be able to emphasize um, uh, the three components, um, basically, that just deal with the issue of water supply and also the issue of sanitation and hygiene promotion. And um, this is what we want to draw uh, a lot of our attention into as we look into this particular subject. So, so in terms of um, the hygiene standards, uh, some of the hygiene standards uh, when it comes to um, uh, 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 the issue of hygiene. Uh, so you can see uh, hygiene, we are talking about um, ensure that there's hygiene promotion standard 1.1. Uh, ensure that um, 1.2 this identification, access, and use of hygiene items. And uh, that photo clearly demonstrates what we need to be able to do uh, when you talk about emphasizing the issue of hygiene. 
and also uh, also looking at menstrual hygiene management and incontinence, which has also become a very uh, important uh, uh, issue as well. Then there is also part um, uh, part B uh, of the same standards. Uh, this is water supply standards, and um, uh, when it comes to water supply standards, uh, we want to make sure that we are dealing with the issue of um, access and water quantity, which is standard 2.1 in the sphere guidance, and also water quality, uh, standard 2.2, and it is important to be able to emphasize that it is important that people have equitable and affordable access to sufficient quantity of safe water uh, to be able to meet their drinking and domestic needs as, as much as possible. And then again, also, when you talk about uh, uh, water supply standards and uh, the issue of access and water quantity standard, uh, some of the critical things that we mentioned, this one I wanted to mention the specific targets so that um, these ones can be very familiar with us because uh, if we are uh, participating in wash, wash interventions, uh, it is always good to make sure that um, we are aware of some of these, uh, some of the, uh, the uh, it's, it's very, very important that we're able to look at some of these um, uh, aspects as much as, as possible. So, uh, so it is important uh, to make sure that uh, we can actually be able to look at um, some of these uh, household uh, um, uh, distance uh, uh, from the household uh, become uh, very, very important, and um, it is important uh, to be able to uh, to be able to look at this. So the distance from any household to the nearest water point should be 500 meters. Uh, so it's good to make sure that we understand that, and the queue and the queuing time uh, at water resources uh, should actually be less than 30 minutes. So uh, in case we are queuing. Uh, for water, and then let that be less than 30 minutes. Then the maximum uh, number of people per tap, uh, based on a flow rate of 7.5 liters per minute, uh, should actually be 250 people per tap. And uh, uh, it is important to make sure that we can keep those standards uh, as expected. So, uh, so it's good to make sure we can look at that. Then the, the other uh, key standard, uh, is on water quality. Uh, we need to make sure that um, we are able to uh, look into the whole issue of water quality uh, so that we are able to understand also uh, why it is important uh, to be able to look at uh, uh, the issue uh, of water quality as much as possible. And, um, and um, it is important um, um, uh, to be able to understand that uh, where we are able to understand uh, the issue of uh, uh, of water quality as well. So, uh, so one of the things that we want to be able to uh, uh, say uh, in regards to uh, in regards to uh, water quality uh, is that percentage of water quality tests that are actually meeting minimum water quality standards uh, should be as follows. And um, uh, we need to only ensure that uh, we have less than ten. Uh, colony forming units, and you remember this is the best test for microbiological testing uh, for water. So we need to ensure that we only have 10 uh, colony forming units, uh, that is CFUs uh, per 100 ml of water at the point of delivery, and that is basically uh, unchlorinated water. And so again, uh, if water uh, is chlorinated, then we need to make sure uh, that um, water definitely will have uh, uh, more or less uh, or equal to 0 0.25 or 0 0.5 uh, milligrams uh, free residential chlorine, what we call uh, FRC at the point of delivery. Uh, and that is what we expect as a standard for that. Then also, we also talk about turbidity uh, of the water. Uh, turbidity, uh, turbidity of the water also becomes uh, very, very uh, important, and um, it is important uh, to uh, to make sure that uh, we are able to understand that um, on the issue of turbidity as well, uh, ensuring that um, uh, we can understand uh, what turbidity is as much as possible, because uh, if we don't understand uh, uh, some of those things, uh, then it becomes very hard to be able to understand uh, the issue of uh, uh, 
uh, water uh, uh, sanitation. So, uh, so it is important uh, to make sure that um, we are able to understand uh, this uh, whole issue of stability uh, as much as possible. Now, the other thing um, that um, would be good uh, to be able to emphasize is that stability of less than five uh, NTU or nephelometric stability units uh, is very, very critical. And uh, just to make sure that uh, you have an understanding on to this, uh, maybe uh, demonstrate this uh, through this, uh, 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 through this uh, graphic here. So you can see if water has less than uh, five NTU, you can actually see you can read uh, you can read a book through that water. Uh, if it has more than five NTUs, uh, you can actually not read through the bottle uh, of water. Uh, you can read a book through the bottle of water. If it has a hundred NTU, uh, then it is totally totally turbid, and uh, it is important to make sure that um, uh, we measure water clarity uh, so that we can determine. Uh, if the water is clear enough to be able to chlorinate efficiently because uh, the more turbid the water, the less effective uh, the chlorination as, um, as, 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 as mentioned. Now, the other thing uh, that is good uh, to be able to emphasize is the whole importance of F diagram. Uh, the F diagram um, um, uh, is very, very important uh, to be able to look at that. And um, uh, when you talk about the F diagram, uh, we always say that the main objective of WASH program uh, is to ensure that um, as much as possible, we can reduce public health risks by creating barriers uh, along transmission pathways. Uh, so it's very, very important. Um, basically what we do in WASH interventions is to make sure that we have interventions that uh, ensure that the barriers that are there are broken. And that's why the F diagram really becomes important to actually point to us where they uh, the barriers are broken, or where uh, the chains of um, uh, of, of transmission uh, are actually uh, uh, able to be so. So it's important to be able to know that. Uh, so if you are to be asked, uh, name the five main pathways uh, through which pathogens infect the human body. Uh, this is one of the answers that you will give. So the main pathways for pathogens to infect humans, as we know, are feces, are fluids our fingers, our flies, and their food as well. And um, this is what is normally uh, represented in the F diagram uh, to try and show us uh, how we should be able to uh, avoid uh, having uh, things like, um, uh, uh, things like uh, um, uh, transmission of diseases to, uh, to the people. So, so it is important. Uh, to make sure that um, we can actually be able to uh, understand uh, how to avoid some of those chains of transmission as much as possible. And so this is what is popularly known as the F diagram, and um, we need to be able to uh, see the F diagram and just to be able to understand exactly uh, how beneficial the F diagram is uh, in WASH intervention. So, so the F diagram basically uh, tries to identify the specific uh, chains of disease transmission and ensure that it can actually be able to point the barriers that can actually be able to stop the transmission of the diseases. And um, uh, this is, uh, this can actually uh, be prevented in two ways. Uh, one is um, ensuring that um, we are able to prevent the initial contact uh, with feces or, or through secondary um, barriers, uh, which basically means we prevent it uh, from being ingested by another person. So, so those are the primary barriers that to be ensure that um, we are able to create in the uh, in the transmission pathways. And this basically, uh, these two barriers can actually be enhanced by water uh, intervention. So, uh, the interventions that we are doing, it is good to be able to see those interventions. How are they able to link into the F diagram? So. Uh, as water, uh, uh, as, as humans contact feces, and then uh, still contact fluids, and then flies contact feces, and then flies contact food, and then fingers contact food, and then food uh, transmits the, 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 uh, the, the disease transmission to uh, human beings as well. And uh, we want to make sure 
uh, that we can actually be able to uh, use the F diagram to make sure uh, that we can always be able to avoid the transmission pathways as much as possible. So, uh, so don't worry, this F diagram will be in the copy of the notes that you will actually be sent uh, so that you can be able to review it uh, in a better way to be able to understand it uh, as much as possible. So lastly, uh, let's just handle this uh, uh, aspect of um, uh, the approach for community-led uh, total sanitation. Uh, reason why we picked this up is we know that this is a very important practice, especially uh, when we want to be able to uh, especially stop the issue of open defecation, which is one of the things that um, uh, wash, uh, um, uh, wash uh, sector is actually trying to see if this habit can actually end uh, in most of the places that it is actually practiced uh, as much um, um, as much as possible. And so uh, it's just good to be able to review uh, some of the principles of operations. And then um, I will be able to wind up this discussion by just making you watch a small video that basically uh, emphasizes how uh, community uh, community led total sanitation is actually uh, is actually done so so the approach basically triggers uh, the community into action uh, by ensuring that you can conjure disgust and shame among the members who actually practice open defecation so, so that's why you see we're saying that this is community led so you you basically are uh, inside the community to actually be able uh, to ensure that they can actually bring disgust and shame on the practice of open uh, defecation as expected. And the ultimate objective uh, is to always ensure that we can achieve a total sanitation uh, marked by zero cases of open defecation or open defecation free status as we normally refer to it as ODF. So it primarily focuses on change at the community level and this is what it actually uh, focuses on and not at the individual uh, house level only. And furthermore, it is also uses a non-subsidy non approach <coughs> in which the target community uh, is actually triggered and left to decide the actions that they will actually take to address their sanitation problem. And I want to point you to that word triggering because uh, triggering is what uh, actually makes the CLTS approach uh, very, very uh, effective. And uh, so there are some advantages and disadvantages uh, for this particular practice. And as you can see, um, we have, uh, in terms of advantages, uh, is that we are saying this is a community-led, does not rely on sanitation subsidies from external agencies. So it means uh, your organization can actually be able to pick this approach and work with it uh, because it does not really require a lot of subsidies to be able to uh, effectively uh, put it in place. It also promotes uh, sanitation and hygiene strategies that the community can actually be able to afford and again, it uh, targets on community uh, hygiene behavior change without prescribing how to be able to do it. And the community uh, is able to spread effective behaviors to other communities, hence widening the scope of change uh, in the ODF status, as we mentioned earlier on. So, uh, so it is important uh, to be able to see this. And then the disadvantages uh, is that the success is actually dependent on the quality of community facilitators because the people who will go and engage the community really uh, they are the guys who actually carry the conviction power to make the community actually be able to appreciate uh, this kind of an approach of ending open defecation in their community and then the sustainability of the CL, uh, CLTS is not reliable sometimes because of the cheap approaches that it actually use because you can see uh, sometimes it's not only just ending open defecation, but as you've seen in the F diagram, the chains of transmissions are actually multiple than just the fecal uh, oral route. Uh, there are also other uh, dimensions of contamination that actually come uh, of transmission pathways, and it is important for us to be able to recognize that. So this, the CLTS, uh, the CLTS has that particular challenge and it is important for us to be able to recognize that. Uh, so, uh, so I just want us to be able to watch this small video that basically uh, emphasizes why triggering is one of the critical steps of CLTS. Uh, so what I will do, I uh, might not actually be able to uh, allow you to see it uh, through to the end because uh, I just want to 
uh, see if we can watch about five minutes of it just to emphasize the CL, uh, CLTS approach uh, so that we can have some time to be able to, to pick up on your comments and your questions that you may have uh, for this particular session. Uh, but of course, I will be able to provide the link to the video because it's uh, publicly available uh, so that you can be able to see it. But just have a tester uh, just to see how uh, CLTS approach is effective uh, when it comes to uh, um, uh, uh, dealing with uh, uh, challenges of sanitation and hygiene and particularly the practice of open defecation that is something that we would want to be able to end. So, uh, so basically enjoy this and uh, uh, just allow me to put audio uh, for this particular video so that you can enjoy to be able to have a look at it. Many projects are guilty of triggering CLTS in communities and then forgetting about them. This is a sure way to fail to bringing about collective behavior change. Depending on how well a CLTS is facilitated, one triggering event may be a powerful push for collective change. But no matter how well it was done, one event is never enough. Several weekly or fortnightly follow-up visits are usually required to check 1. Has a community action or sanitation committee been formed? Does it include people from all sub-villagers or neighborhoods within sub-villagers? Kita sebagai pimpinan di sini wajib menyadarkan masyarakat jangan sampai does it include the poorest and the middle income groups or only the well off or the formal leaders and only men? If the committee is too small and composed only of the powerful and only men, what can you do to get them to expand its membership to other groups, the poorer sections, and to women? Two, have they set themselves a target date for becoming an open defecation-free community? If not, it may be necessary to organize a re-triggering event involving more community members 
to create better momentum for change. Awalnya di dusun kami banyak sekali masyarakatnya yang masih berperilaku hidup tidak sehat yaitu dengan buang air besar sembarangan. Tetapi pada bulan November tahun 2010 kita kedatangan tim dari Dinas Kabupaten Jombang untuk memperkenalkan program STBM atau sanitasi total berbasis masyarakat berdasarkan kesepakatan dan komitmen kami pada bulan Februari tahun 2011 kita sudah terbebas dari buang air besar sembarangan. Three, have they devised a progress monitoring tool? Is it a transparent tool such as social map or list of household health and sanitation facility type? Have all OG households been identified and approached for discussion? Is the monitoring done publicly and are the results publicly available for all to see? 4. Have behavioral norms against OD been formulated in the community? Have sanctions for OD been established? Are they being enforced? Bersama pemerintahan desa dan BPD sebagai wakil dari masyarakat desa. Peraturan ini sudah kami sosialisasikan lewat rapat di pemerintahan desa, lewat rapat di PKK, dan di pengajian-pengajian. Peraturan ini berisi teguran, teguran secara lisan dan teguran secara tertulis. Apabila ada yang masih melanggar peraturan ini akan dikenakan denda seratus ribu rupiah. Dengan peraturan yang kami buat tahun 2010 ini, desa kami ada dua dusun yang sudah merupakan dusun ODF. Jadi harapan ke depan mudah-mudahan desa kami ini akan merupakan desa ODF di mana masyarakatnya sudah tidak ada lagi yang buang air besar sembarangan. It is important to find out what exactly is obstructing behavior change by all households. Are all OD household aware that improved sanitation facilities need not be costly? Do they have access to information about low-cost but safe sanitation options? Do they have access to service providers, supplies, or finances? To access these options. As a program manager or implementer, is there something that you can do about their problems of access to information, supplies, service providers, or financing? Then comes the verification of progress. When a community declares itself open defecation free, there must be independent verification of the claim. Experience shows that without independent verification, real ODF status is highly unlikely. In Indonesia, we learned that a team verification exercise worked well to spread public awareness of what an ODF community means. The verification teams include local health center staff and members of neighboring communities. Dan nanti kalau misalkan dari bilangku verifikasi itu nanti sudah ODF, sudah nilainya satu-satu, langsung di rumahnya kita tempelkan on the appointed day, the external team assembles at the village office, is briefed about what and how to check, and given an observation checklist. 
kami bertiga sudah uh, melihat Indonesia dengan ibu sudah saya nyatakan sehat dan bersih dan selesai cebok sudah pakai sabun saya nyatakan WC ibu sudah dikatakan sehat maka dari itu saya tempeli stiker WC ibu sehat They fan out into the community, visit, observe, and interview every household. And within a couple of hours, assemble back at the village office to tally and present their results to the community gathering. Whether the community meets the criteria for being ODA is determined on the spot at the public meeting. If it does not, the verification team will explain why melakukan verifikasi di lapangan untuk dusun Kreper Utara Yun Sewu ya, masih ditemukan kotoran bayi tidak langsung dibuang ke WC kemudian yang satunya lagi masih kita temukan WC atau jamban cemplung yang belum ada tutupnya ya. jadi untuk dusun Kreper Utara ini belum dikatakan dusun yang ODM ya. bebas buang air besar di sembarang Actions are agreed right there and then about the improvement that needs to be made before a re-verification on an agreed date. Declaration could inaugurate when community meets recommendation by independent committee and invited communities including the local leader to declare the ODF status. Deklarasi menyatakan bahwa satu, telah 100% menggunakan sarana sanitasi jambat. Okay, so yeah, so so I think you've been able to watch that, and uh, uh, thank you so much uh, for being able to follow that uh, discussion of uh, community-led total sanitation. And um, I think now we can be able to take a few questions, and then um, allow also Irene to make a few uh, comments as well. Uh, so, uh, so so what you do is uh, just just raise your hand. Uh, just raise your hand where you are. Uh, if you could just uh, be able to uh, be able to uh, raise your hand from uh, from where you are, I think uh, uh, it is possible to actually be able to uh, see you and uh, be able to uh, just allow you to make uh, a question or a comment that you may have. So, uh, in um, when you go to where your name is, uh, you should be able to get an option for raising the hand. And um, I can just take two questions uh, just before I allow Irene to make some few comments as well. So, uh, so let's just uh, be able to take some few questions uh, so that um, uh, we can actually be able to. So, uh, so I think uh, let's start with um, uh, somebody who's not put their name. And so, uh, the name that is showing, is, showing, is, showing. is Del. 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 Yeah. So. Uh, do you have a, a question or a comment, um, uh, Del? I can see your hand is raised. Uh, so, uh, so do you have a comment? Uh, maybe you can be able to, uh, you can be able to make that comment as well. Uh, Del, Del, if you're there, uh, if uh, uh, maybe the host, you can unmute Del uh, so that Del can be able to make their comment, and uh, they will let us know their name uh, because the name uh, is not indicated there. 
Okay, I think we still can be able to hear from Del. So, William? Oh, yeah, yeah, Del is on. Hello? So we, can, we can get a question from Del and then William. Hello? Um, uh, yeah, so make your can question. You can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, okay, fine. Actually, there is some problem with the volume, I think. Hello? 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 Okay, there is some problem with the volume. And volume. Oh, there's a problem with the volume. Uh, right now it's okay. Right now it's okay. Okay. So okay. make a question or comment. Uh, I, I have and, and, a comment. Tell us your name. Tell us your name. Uh, I'm tell us Dr. your name. Abdul Sattar ah, okay. Khan from Pakistan. Uh, basically, okay. a public health specialist and nowadays working as district health officers in one of the northern districts of Pakistan. Uh, ah, okay. Uh, uh, Stephen, it was really a very excellent and nice presentation we have had and really you have covered from A to Z, I would say. And I think all the participants would have been quite happy to hear you from your side. Uh, what I would like to say, because being a public health specialist, because uh, if I look at your presentation, theoretically it has covered from A to Z, I already said. And many things you have mentioned, they're absolutely 110% correct. And especially the, you talked about the disparities in different countries and then you talked about the availability of fresh water that is jumbled within 10 countries and others are getting just very few. So the problems are there. But when I was going through the, your lecture, I was thinking, okay, what will be the most important thing to address these things? In the end, what I'm happy with and what I would like to encourage is that the diagram, I mean, what you have shown the model, community-led model, you have shown yeah. that's very important yeah. and i yeah. think the basic the cornerstone of all of this is that until unless your community participates until unless they own the thing until unless they are driven towards this i think there will be no success in literally terms so really this is a good model and i think it does not cost too much and uh, but we are thinking that we are from the poor country like pakistan third world countries or like developing countries we have our problems and keeping those problems in view I think if you are focusing on these things, this is really an excellent model and a praiseable model. And hopefully with all, I think, all of people from different places all over the world and globe, and especially from developing countries. And I would do recommend this thing. I think what you have said is more than enough. So this was my comment. And uh, literally would like to hope with you again and soon whatever you have. So very beneficial lecture and very beneficial um, uh, presentation. Thank you all very much, Stephen. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you for uh, being able to connect all the way from Pakistan and um, uh, just being able to recognize the importance of the community led total sanitation. Actually, if you look, uh, that is one of the approach that can actually be able to especially address some of those challenges because it all uh, goes back to uh, the community individual and how he is able to participate and ensure uh, that um, some of these um, uh, issues are well addressed because if we don't have initiative from the community itself, uh, there's little that the government or the other yes, practitioners, yes. Uh, the uh, community-based organizations or the national governmental organizations or civil society organizations, there's less they can do uh, if the community itself does not take an up hand. So it's very good to hear from, uh, uh, from me about that. And uh, thank you so much for your comment. Um, I Always, think we welcome. Can also Always take, welcome. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. Welcome. Uh, we can also take a, a comment or question from uh, William, uh, and um, I think that should be the last one. Just before I give um, uh, some time to Irene, uh, of course, we will be having these sessions more often, and so we will be able to uh, be having an opportunity to engage more uh, on this particular area. So, William and Yolito, if um, you can actually be able yeah. to uh, Hello, make your Steve. comment and question. Keep it, um, keep it uh, brief, please. Yes, please. Yes, please. So, William, um, I'm from Uganda, Caritas, Uganda. <laughs> I would like to add my voice thanking you for the wonderful presentation that you have made to us. And uh, as you have advised, I'm going to be very brief. Um, when you were presenting underwater and sanitation, you kept on putting data from um, between 1990 to uh, 2015. I'm wondering how that uh, uh, data are still uh, relevant to the current uh, uh, water 
and sanitation problems. Maybe you may need to clarify on that. And then the second observation, I wanted uh, you, if you could probably try to elaborate a little bit more on how improved standard of wash uh, is related to better education outcome. Thank you. Ah, okay, okay. Yeah, so thank you, William. Uh, you have uh, been able to uh, 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 give in your questions um, uh, very, very clearly. And um, one of the reasons why, uh, what uh, significance of data is just to paint us um, uh, the problem, uh, basically. And so uh, we were not so much uh, interested to look at the, um, uh, the current situation. Uh, we were just trying to emphasize the problem that has been there uh, when, uh, when you talk about um, water and sanitation challenges. And so the data was just to give us just a rough idea of exactly uh, the situation at hand. Uh, but um, sometimes also um, uh, into this course, if you get to sign into this course, we normally go into the current status, uh, particularly right now when uh, uh, we are tracking the sustainable development goals. And uh, you know that there's the joint monitoring program that um, uh, particularly just being able to uh, check on how different countries are faring uh, in terms of issues to do with uh, water sanitation um, uh, in different areas. And um, uh, in the course, we are able to go into that and look into the current data. Uh, but basically what we just wanted to use this is just, um, as just some definitional concepts to basically have you see uh, the nature of the problem that we have seen. And also just to mention, uh, a difference of um, uh, from 2015 to six years uh, is not much. And that's why you find, uh, particularly when we are making targets, we normally make targets of 10 year uh, targets or 15 years target or 30 year targets, because that's what gives a significant difference. So a difference of five years will not be much. Uh, so those um, data would still uh, be as much relevant as much as um, uh, they are of 2015. But we just wanted to paint a picture. Again, also how does uh, the challenge of uh, water and sanitation uh, basically also deal to um, um, uh, um, uh, affect the educational outcome uh, is that you know that um, uh, most of the times when um, uh, children uh, suffer from these diarrheal diseases, they are not able to go to school uh, because they have to seek uh, treatment and that affects the number of children that are going to school. Again, if uh, young girls and the young women have to spend uh, quite a number of hours looking for water, then again also you see that um, uh, we, we will not be able to have uh, enough of the uh, um, uh, girls attending school, and that is specifically how it affects uh, uh, education. So, so it has a very uh, direct correlation uh, with education uh, as an outcome. Uh, I think, um, 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 I hope I've been able to address your question, William. And uh, no. I think because of, yeah? Yes, I just, so I just want to have some question. Eh? Okay, uh, Abanya, just uh, hold on uh, because um, you have to uh, you have to be appointed. Uh, let's just uh, uh, respect the modalities of the uh, of the forum. Uh, so, um, uh, so Abanya, you will. Um, uh, I just need to ask Irene. Uh, do you think we have some time to take um, a question, maybe from Abanya and? Um, Maybe one, uh, 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 we also take a question from a lady also to represent the gender sensitivity. Um, okay. And if you can yeah. allow me, is it possible we take two more questions? Yeah, we can take three more. Uh, I can see there's okay. a lady, Martha. And, okay. Uh, then we can, we can finish. Okay, okay. So three Abanya, you can go, go ahead, Abanya, and uh, make your question. And then Martha, you can make your question. And then uh, who else do we have here? Uh, we also have uh, uh, Mahmoud uh, Sheikh Ahmed. Uh, so we can, uh, we can basically just be able to have uh, those three questions and then we can, uh, we can be able to wind up. So uh, unfortunately, uh, if we, I didn't select you, I think you can just put your question on the chat uh, because we normally pick those questions and uh, we'll respond to them and send back the answers to you and you will be able to see as you get the presentation. Uh, for today. Uh, so uh, don't worry if you didn't have that opportunity. But Abanya, please go ahead so that we can save on time as well. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much for, for the opportunity. First of all, I appreciate your wonderful presentation. 
I'm already Freddy Abanya from uh, South Sudan. I, I just would like to, to understand really, there are very many uh, several sanitation interventions uh, project have been uh, going on in South Sudan, but they are actually failing to achieve the desire. So I would like to understand here why so many projects fail to achieve the results. Okay. Uh, okay. Yes, two, okay. uh, kindly you, you, you send us the, the audio and then the, the slides, both for M and E and this, and this session. Thank you very much. Ah, okay, okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, that's a very good question. Uh, that's a very good question in regards to, uh, of course, um, uh, I've been to South Sudan and I know there's a lot of uh, interventions, uh, particularly to do with uh, water and sanitation interventions. And um, uh, one of the things that, um, as, uh, uh, as Abanya is saying, is why do these um, interventions sometimes uh, really fail to have uh, success uh, in some of these areas. And one of the things that you can see is what we were just uh, being able to suggest there, where uh, you allow some of these interventions to be community-led, you know, uh, because um, uh, there's much you can do because you have donor funds and um, you can be able to implement activities. Uh, but nonetheless, those interventions actually uh, are appreciated by the community and are actually led by the community. Really, they will not have any uh, significant um, impact at the end of the day. And I think uh, one of the things that I would um, uh, particularly recommend for you, Abanya, uh, is if uh, some of these interventions can purely turn to the CLTS approach where we look into how can the community be able to lead uh, some of these interventions, accept that there are challenges that we have to deal with, uh, make sure that um, uh, we can raise awareness on the challenge uh, of uh, water, sanitation, and hygiene in the community and allow the community to actually be able to lead this effort through. I think in the video you saw how uh, these efforts have been able to bear fruit in Indonesia, uh, particularly when uh, the, uh, the government representatives, the community representatives, uh, the community uh, health workers are able to come in together and mobilize a whole village uh, to end uh, the practice of open defecation and they're able to monitor and confirm that the village has actually been uh, been able to become an open defecation free village. So uh, community led initiatives really work well and I hope uh, I've been able to uh, respond to your uh, uh, question Abanya and um, maybe I can be able to allow now to uh, get a question also uh, from Martha uh, in Zikuru um, so if you have a question or a comment, uh, please, Mother, you can proceed. Thank you very much, Stephen, for the presentation. Um, I'm Martha from Uganda. I work with Caritas Uganda and we have a, a WASH project in a Big Bidi refugee settlement. And now the the presentation is really good and as you you notice we have a lot of interventions on water and in your presentation you you said as per 2015 there were about 6,603 million people who are still using an improved water source um what i'm wondering is do you have a plan for this kind of shortage that is happening in the world. Okay. Uh, so, so, uh, so thank you for, uh, thank you, Martha, for uh, that question. And um, one of the things that um, uh, the, the strategy for uh, some of these um, uh, statistics that we have shared is that, um, I remember this is statistics that have been collected um, um, uh, through the intervention of the UN, uh, because uh, the UN uh, basically has set targets, very, very specific targets, uh, when it comes to the issue of uh, uh, water and sanitation. And, um, and um, through what they call the joint monitoring plan, uh, they are able to actually uh, uh, monitor. So the JMP is actively monitoring some of the, um, uh, the local situation happening in different countries. And that, when you go there, there's actually live data uh, that is um, uh, reported from different countries. 
And why this is monitored is to make sure, now even in the donor world, where do we need to ensure that uh, funds to go into WASH uh, interventions, where should we be able to direct them? Because if we find particular countries are not actually uh, showing some impact, then we need to direct more funds or channel uh, more solutions to some of those uh, uh, countries uh, to make sure that we have some improved data uh, coming from some of these regions as, as much as possible. So, so there is actually um, an active plan in place, and this is championed by the UN, and, um, uh, and also uh, the, uh, particularly in the JMP, the UN is um, a key um, uh, concerned about that through its agencies, the WHO and also the UNICEF, uh, UNICEF and WHO are actively uh, so much um, um, uh, in the setup of the JMP just to collect data uh, in regards to water and sanitation from different areas. So these problems are not just data uh, that, uh, that is just provided for the sake of knowing, but actively the, the donor world is able to use the data to actually know where to channel uh, some of these resources because of the, uh, the, the gravity uh, of the problem. So, so that's basically what is happening at the moment, just to make sure that um, uh, we are able to uh, cover some of these areas, uh, particularly uh, very, very well. So, uh, so it's good to be able to note that. And uh, thank you, uh, Martha, for your question. And um, I hope uh, we have been uh, of, uh, uh, of help to your concern. Yes, thank you. OK. Then I think we had uh, asked uh, someone else to be able to ask a question. Was this uh, Mahmoud? Um, I don't, uh, uh, I'm not able to see them in my list again. Uh, so, uh, so maybe I would just ask Agustine Bahati. Uh, I don't know whether they were able to disconnect because I can still, I can see the hand is no longer raised. Uh, maybe, or maybe we have been able to address the question. Uh, so maybe uh, just to have the last uh, third person uh, respond, let's just allow Agustin. Agustin Bahati, uh, you can make your comment or question. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much, Stephen. Uh, I'm appreciating uh, the presentation, which was very clear and uh, also which was uh, very excellent. Uh, now, we, me, uh, I work for an NGO, local NGO, which is called uh, Aride Kuwaho, as I see it, as um, we work in WASH, we, are, uh, we have the specialist in WASH, and we have uh, many achievements in WASH. So uh, my question is, uh, we have uh, worked also in sanitation, whereby we use the also CLTS, uh, but uh, my question is, uh, you know, our community around us, uh, they, are, they are the poor community, as you know, would wish that, that uh, the, the CLTS can be uh, successful in our community. As uh, from your experience, uh, experiences, what do you think and what can you advise us so as uh, CLTS can be successful in our poor community? Thank you very much. Ah, okay, okay. Yeah, so, so I think that's a question to do with, um, uh, you want to be able to implement the CLTS approach uh, in um, and you dealing with um, communities that are vulnerable uh, or uh, poor households, and um, that really becomes uh, a challenge. And I think it's a, it's a good question that um, uh, is coming from uh, Augustine, uh, in the sense that um, uh, when you look at that particular um, aspect of uh, the fact that the interventions have to be community led, uh, then um, you are you are you are looking into uh, you're looking into uh, uh, asking the community to go ahead and uh, improve their own sanitation facilities, which might not be very, very possible, especially for uh, communities that are actually uh, in, uh, um, are vulnerable or they come uh, from um, uh, areas that um, um, uh, we will normally designate as, 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 as less developed areas or arid areas where we know uh, we get a lot of these uh, poor households. And so what we advocate for that is that, um, of course, you will have the CLTS approach because you want um, uh, your, uh, your interventions to be successful in the fact that they will be community-led. Uh, but then again, uh, we don't say that you exclusively just use the CLTS approach. You can also combine with other approaches where uh, you can also have um, uh, some donors uh, funding you 
on uh, some sanitation infrastructure, uh, which allows you uh, to be able to provide um, uh, sanitation. But then again, now, uh, this is something that you mix with the CLTS approach so that um, as much as you have uh, funds to be able to give these communities to be able to construct uh, sanitation facilities, uh, then again, you have to make sure that it is community led. So, so a mixed approach uh, is not always harmful and um, it is something that can also be able to lead to success, especially when you're dealing with vulnerable people. So, uh, so that's what I will advise Augustine and I hope I've been uh, very, very clear uh, on that. So, so far, I think... Um, Thank you, Thank you yeah. Stephen. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay, you're welcome, Augustine. Uh, so, let's now be able to have um, um, Irene come in uh, so that um, Irene will be able to wrap up uh, the session for us and just tell us uh, exactly uh, what will be the next steps and uh, what will be probably uh, the next uh, events that we'll be able to have. So, Irene, uh, you can come in and thank you all and uh, looking forward to meet you again. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Stephen, for the one.